So when you have a fever of 103 and decide to make a YouTube video, three things are going to happen. First, you find out through the YouTube comments that when you're sick, you end up sounding like Dipper from Gravity Falls. You were listening to girly Icelandic pop sensation Baba? No, <laughs> I wasn't. It's not important. Second, you convince yourself that, for whatever reason, Viacom owns Disney. Disney wants to commission a hit because for some reason Viacom wants more money. And third, and finally, you come up with an insane conspiracy theory that Disney is looking to the rising popularity of musicals in order to find musicians to work on their new animated adventures. A conspiracy theory which Disney totally proves is actually true when they hire Mr. Hamilton himself to work on their next big hit, Moana. And it shows! Both Frozen and Moana have a strong female lead, both have an opening number that explains the economy of the local populace, And each of the sidekicks gets their own comedic relief tune that explores their warped sense of the world. I drink in my hand, my snow up against the burning sand, probably getting gorgeously tanned in summer. When you're staring at a demigod, what can I say except you're welcome? And of course, both have that one big show-stopping number that was written to sell albums. But that wasn't the part of Moana that really grabbed my attention. This was. So let me see if I can explain why this is such a great musical moment. Uh, throughout history, Disney has had a tendency to set their films in a variety of different countries and cultures. And as wonderful and cosmopolitan as that all is, it immediately creates a problem for the music department. Now you have to figure out what and or how you're going to musically deal with communicating the setting of this film. Uh, on one hand, you can just ignore the setting and continue with whatever style of music the producers had originally intended. This is where you're going to find your Aladdins and Jungle Books. There isn't a whole lot about these films that really musically suggests that we're in the Middle East or India. and whatever there is that might be trying to suggest that we're in the Middle East or India, well... Well, honestly, that's a subject all on its own. But on the other side of the spectrum, if you want to try to musically communicate your story setting, you can try to include music that's culturally significant to the area, but then you start moving dangerously close to the whole... <laughs> And the world of ethnomusicology, or the study of music with relation to cultural significance, is incredibly complicated. Not all cultures place the same weight on music, some cultures don't even acknowledge music the same way we do, and not all experts really agree on how everything is defined in ethnomusicology. It's all just really dense and complicated. So just trying to copy and paste a specific piece of music, or whatever you might think sounds indicative of a certain culture's music, almost always spells for disaster. This is where people like to point out instances where Disney might not have been as culturally aware as they could have been, and this is where you tend to see a lot of people talking about films like Pocahontas, and I mean, I guess it's kind of right, but I would rather talk about Brother Bear. See, in this scene in Brother Bear, you hear this piece of music called Transformation. And you might start thinking to yourself, Oh, that sounds really different. It totally communicates the sort of ethnic tone to the story. I feel so culturally aware right now. Now, if I have any weeaboo, uh, excuse me, uh, anime fans in the audience, you might find that this actually sounds kind of familiar, probably because it sounds really similar to the opening to Ghost in the Shell. <laughs> That might have something to do with the fact that both of these pieces use Bulgarian choir music. Ghost in the Shell was heavily inspired by it, but I think they actually hired a Bulgarian women's choir to sing for this piece specifically. So they used music that most people hadn't heard of, that had nothing to do with the context of the film, in order to make the scene sound, I don't know, more magical? Alien? And if it doesn't seem like there's anything wrong with that... Eh... But there's actually one thing that they did really well in this scene. If you listen closely and happen to have an incredibly thorough understanding of the languages of the world, you'll hear that the lyrics in this piece are in Inupiat, which is the language that belongs to a group of people by the same name who are from Alaska where this film is set. So this film actually got something right in that they used a language other than English to represent a native population, and that is very important. Now I know in the past that I've discussed how lyrics aren't music, and I stand by that. Studying lyrics is more like studying poetry than music. That's why almost any composer that's ever written opera has had a librettist, someone who wrote the words for them. 
But if you're going to write a piece of music that uses lyrics, i.e. a song, then you're going to have to alter your piece of music in order to fit your lyrics. It isn't as easy as just writing a piece of music and then slapping words wherever you want them. The act of text setting is an art form unto itself. And one of the most important aspects of text setting is figuring out how you're going to musically emphasize the syllables in your lyrics. Um, if you give each syllable a note, that's called syllabic text setting. I am the very model of a modern major general, her life information, vegetable, animal, and mineral. I know the kings of England and I quote the fights historical from Marathon to Waterloo in order categorical. If you give each syllable multiple notes, that's called melismatic text setting. Ooh. Okay, uh, l l let me just go ahead and stop you right there. Y you sound terrible. And if you mix and match, it's called pneumatic. But creating a musical emphasis on different syllables is really important. Otherwise, your song won't make sense. Here's an example. It's happy birthday to you, not happy birthday to you. But different languages won't necessarily have the same number of syllables for words that have direct translations. On top of that, every language puts varying emphasis on different syllables. That's one of the more difficult aspects of learning a language, and why most people will stress that you have to go out into the world and learn from a native speaker, because you can't really learn syllabic stress and their meanings from a book. Cheat the pennant line! The pennant line! What are you doing? What are you doing? No, what are you doing? What are you doing? No, what are you doing? What are you doing? So what all this means is that if you compose a piece of music for a certain language, you've already altered the fundamental structure of your piece of music. If I write a piece of music for a French text, I would have never written that exact same piece of music even if the text had the same meaning but happened to be in English. That's why a lot of song translations can sound kind of awkward. If you don't believe me, just look up Disney songs in other languages or YouTube a few English covers of anime openings. You'll see what I mean in that sometimes the piece will become more melismatic or syllabic because the translated language will have too many or too few syllables. This is a critical reason as to why most operas and high art songs won't get translated from their original language. So even though Brother Bear uses Bulgarian music to try and convey an Alaskan sound, which, all right, they were actually on the right track by using the native language. Using a song set from a text from a native language in order to represent a native population of the area creates a new piece of music that would not have otherwise existed had the composer just ignored the setting and written everything in English. You can still represent a native population or culture without having to tread close to the hole. <laughs> And you can actually see this exact situation in the opening to The Lion King. They would have not arrived at a piece of music that sounded like what they have had they not used Zulu. The Zulu speech patterns, syllabic stresses, and literally just the number of syllables that they had to take into account just would not have happened had they written the entire piece in English. In The Hunchback of Notre Dame, they throw a bunch of Latin around, and even though it might not explicitly reference the chant that it comes from, <laughs> it still lends that old Catholic sound to all the music. You can hear something similar in the opening to Frozen with Voeli. The song was inspired by Sami Joking and a Danish hymn called Deilig er Jorden. So because it's inspired by Sami Joking, I'm pretty sure this tune doesn't use any explicit language with a direct translation. But that's important, because the yoking style of singing wouldn't always use the native language. This is a rare instance where using the native language would have actually been the wrong move. Um, there's a similar situation in Pocahontas. So even though you see and hear Pocahontas speak a little Powhatan in the film, having anyone sing in Powhatan would have been a big problem. Most Native American singing isn't done with their respective languages. Like most Sami Yoking, Native American music is sung using vocables, or syllables that have no linguistic meaning but are significant as lyrics for music. Again, cultures are really complicated, so this isn't a hard and fast rule. But when you hear this in the opening to Steady as the Beating Drum, Like the opening to Frozen, it remains true to how the indigenous population would treat language with their music. 
But even though all of these pieces of music use lyrics, be they linguistic or not, that are significant to the native population, does it really convey where these stories are taking place? Did anyone hear the opening to Frozen and immediately think, ah, yes, of course, we're in Scandinavia? Unless your audience is familiar with the language, music, or lyrical style, or just the general sound of whatever culture you're trying to simulate, the entire process is kind of lost. The best way to remedy this problem is to actually have characters sing in these other languages. That way, even if the audience has no idea what language they're hearing, the cultural expression is anchored in the characters and not just the setting of the story. In the first four examples, we don't really see anyone singing in any other languages. Everyone, for the most part, just speaks English, and the disembodied voices sing in languages other than English. They might represent the land or the setting, but not the people or the culture, so it kind of ends up missing the point. It makes more sense to have the music be more diegetic, in order to relate it to the people that it's trying to describe. For example, in Brave, you hear Merida's mother sing, uh, Magdine Ban Oasel. Wow, I'm really sorry. It's a little lullaby written in Gaelic, and specifically written for this film, and it's played during a flash scene where Merida is very young and frightened by a storm. One of the unique aspects of this scene is that the characters switch between languages. The queen speaks in English, but then sings in Gaelic. The implication is that most of the audience won't really understand the Gaelic, which makes the piece sound that much more personal. The queen isn't just singing a Scottish piece, she's a Scottish queen specifically singing a piece of music in a Scottish language to her Scottish daughter. Even if you haven't been paying attention and don't know where the film is set or who the two characters are, you can understand the significance of the relationship by the queen singing in a native language, even though English is the vernacular. I'll always be right here. There's a similar instance in the opening to Lilo and Stitch, where the music is more diegetic, or at least that's the implication. Even though for the majority of the song you don't see the choir or the soloist, you do see the Ipu players playing along with what you hear, and the ensemble finishes the piece. <laughs> Same goes for the scene where Nani is singing Aloha Oi to Lilo. This serves a triple function. First, it demonstrates the efficacy of having a character sing in a native language as opposed to the vernacular. Second, this piece of music actually makes sense in terms of the narrative. Aloha Oi was written by Queen Lilu Uakalani, the last monarch of the Kingdom of Hawaii, and Aloha Oi translates to Farewell to Thee. It became a symbol for the loss of her country and was sung at her funeral. And in this scene, Nani thinks she's losing Lilo, so she tells Lilo goodbye in the most Hawaiian way she can. And third, because this piece of music exists in the real world, it actually serves to anchor the listener in an authentically Hawaiian sonic landscape. It's the musical equivalent of having an establishing shot of a city with the Eiffel Tower in the background in order to visually communicate to the audience that we are in Paris. Wait, but wait, but if we're using a real piece of music that has serious cultural significance in a piece of media that isn't explicitly written, created by, and for that culture, then isn't this cultural appropriation? <laughs> Wait, does that mean that having an establishing shot of the Eiffel Tower is architectural cultural appropriation? <laughs> Jeez, I don't know anymore. Either way, you must now see where this is all going. We went from using a Bulgarian women's choir to make a story in Alaska sound magical, to using native languages to establish where these stories are set, to having characters sing in native languages in order to implicate said characters in the cultural context that these stories are trying to demonstrate, to now actually using music as a way to facilitate a method of communication between the represented culture on screen and the suggested culture of the audience. So, We Know the Way begins in Tokelauan, but unlike any of the other pieces of original music we've seen so far, We Know the Way translates to English midway while trying to maintain a consistent musical structure. Now, we see something like this in the circle of life, but as soon as the song translates to English, the melody changes, because of how difficult it is to maintain a consistent musical style while switching from one language to another. But here, they do everything they can to keep all of the music consistent, even though the language changes. In this case, you're given a musical demonstration of how the language influences how the music is constructed and how translating that piece of music to English creates such a difference. And to prove that to you, I have a little experiment. This is going to be a musical version of one of those magic eye pictures. On the left, you're going to hear and see the token Lawan section of this piece. And on the right, you're going to see and hear the English part. <laughs> So 
this piece doesn't just demonstrate how using a different language can change a piece of music. It literally shows the audience how this piece of music specifically has to change in order to go from the native language of the representative population to the English that the audience hears the characters speaking to each other. The transition between Tokelau and English bridges the gap between cultures in such a way that the audience doesn't even notice. There's even a subtle transition where you stop seeing the cast singing when the piece translates to English, implying that the people on screen are so detached from the audience's culture that they literally don't speak English. None of that magical Disney magic translation because love BS. This piece uses music as a common language in order to highlight, emphasize, and celebrate the cultural divide between the audience and the characters in the story in a way that's both welcoming and understanding. It doesn't just demonstrate that this film is set in a Polynesian culture, it musically welcomes the audience to cross the cultural divide and explore the world of Moana. Anyway, that's it for me for now. Thank you guys for watching. I really appreciate it. Um, if you want to help me make these videos a little faster and a little cleaner, consider donating to my Patreon page. And if you have any music questions, follow me on Twitter and Twitch so I can answer your questions live. But other than that, thanks for watching. Oh yeah, by the way, Disney, uh, I know you're listening. If you want to make a lot of money, and I mean a lot of money, have your next Disney princess be South Korean.